In times like these everyone lacks hope, purpose and salvation. As a result, humanity is subject to its sinful nature, chasing depravity and abolishing all sense of decency, believing that this might fill the emptiness they have in their lives. Whether it may be adultery, seeking fame on social media, or striving for riches. All these bring no fulfillment and leave one with a bitter aftertaste. However, every human has hope, purpose and a salvation and that in only Jesus Christ. He sacrificed himself for our sins so that we may have the salvation which is eternal life in heaven. But not only this. In him you will find hope for the future. Because we Christians know that all things work together for good to them that love God. If you accept these facts, you are equipped to lead a purposeful lifestyle in Christ. May Jesus Christ bless you in your walk. You could see how the Holy Bible is so beautifully structured by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to the holy man of God. St. Paul received this this manifestation, this inspiration by the Holy Spirit. And the way St. Paul writes is absolutely magnificent. So much, it has so much depth and essence. And we need to stop every time we read the epistles of, of St. Paul because he is one of the greatest theologians the world had and will ever see. St. Paul, extremely deep in his teachings, extremely deep in the way he writes his epistles. So now, there are three fruits, love, joy, and peace. Now, the first branch is what feeds that fruit, and the third branch is what protects the fruit. So, for example, love, has long-suffering and faithfulness attached to it. Now, long-suffering is what feeds love. Faithfulness is what protects love. So love needs nourishment, needs protection in order to flourish, in order to expand, and in order to be preserved and made wholesome intact. Now... The reason why, the reason why the fruits are three, because, and these three are one. So love, long-suffering, faithfulness, they're one. Because every single tree is made out of three sections. There is the roots, there is the trunk and the branches, and there is the fruits. They are three. But these three are, they're all one tree. So the tree is made out of roots, one, the trunk and the branches, two, and then the fruits, three. So the roots is love, the trunk and the branches is long-suffering, the fruits is faithfulness. This is the way we put it in a simple term to understand how St. Paul is talking in his epistle to the Galatians 5, 22 to 24. So now we're going to come. Why are the fruits three? Love, joy, and peace. Why are, they, why are they three? Because the God we believe in, the God we worship is Trinitarian. Three in one and one in three. They are three persons in one essence, one nature. There is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. One God. Amen. Hear, O Israel, your, the Lord is, your God is one. Hear, O Israel, your God is one. But this one God cannot be just one. He is three in one and one in three. And God created us in his image according to his likeness. And we are three in one and one in three. When we read the epistle of St. Paul to the, it's, 1 Thessalonians 5.23. In 1 Thessalonians 5.23, St. Paul says the human being is made out of body, soul, and spirit. Three. But these three, they make one man, one person. But this one person cannot be just one unit, as some claim, especially in Judaism and Islam. They say God is just one and cannot be more than one. 
In essence, this is impossible. Why? Because I'll ask anyone who believes in the true divine God. Do you believe God exists? They'll have to say yes. Otherwise, where did existence come from if God had not pre-existed to this existence? So therefore, they'll say God exists. Yes. Do you believe God is wise? Is, is, he is intelligent. He has a brain. They'll say yes. Otherwise, where did this intelligent universe and life came about if there was not an intelligent being behind all of this? So God exists. God is wise intellectually. He's got a brain. And God is the living God. He lives forever. So God has a life. Otherwise, where did this life come from if there was no source to this life? So God exists. God has a brain. God is a life. These are the three in one. God's existence is the father. God, the, the brain is the son. God, the life is the Holy Spirit. But that does not make God three. He is one in nature, in essence. But three persons preserved in one nature, in one essence. That is why the fruits of the Holy Spirit are three. Love, joy, peace. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Now, one other thing, when we talk about God, and when we look at the Holy Bible, how God introduces himself, we go to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, the very beginning of the Old Testament. You see, it says the following, Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, the Old Testament, it is written mostly in Hebrew. The, the original uh, text or the original language of the Old Testament is Hebrew. So when we go back to the original, original text, you will see it says the following. In the beginning, not God, Elohim. Or we call in Aramaic Syriac, the language we speak, Elohim. Elohim. So when you go to the original text, you will understand more in depth. Because in translation, we lose a percentage of the original text. There is no one language that is 100% identical to the next. It is absolutely normal to lose a certain percentage of the meaning of the original language. If I'm translating from English into Arabic or Chinese or any other language, I cannot translate word for word because uh, there are certain terminologies in English that cannot make sense if I translate them literally into another language. So I need to find the closest possible way to reflect what that verse in English truly meant. So when you go to the original text in Hebrew, you will see in the beginning, Elohim, Elohim. Now, Elohim is the magnification of singularity. What do I mean by that? When someone like Donald Trump, the president of the United States of America, the superpower nation that is so powerful, when a president of the United States of America stands and talks, he does not talk in a singular format, but rather in a pluralistic format. He will never say, I, the president. He will say, we, the president of the United States of America. Why? Because the magnification of the singular unit is mightiness. When you say, I, that is weakness. But when you say, we, that is strength and mightiness. Now, since... I am holding a position so powerful, I need to speak the language that is reflective of that powerful position. That is why when the Lord God came to creating things, he called himself Elohim. No other name. See, everything has a meaning. Now, Elohim is the magnification of, of the singular unit. Therefore, he is talking with mightiness. 
Why mightiness? Because God says, I am mighty when it comes to creation. Why? Because I'm the only being that can make out of nothing everything and out of everything nothing. There is no being, no one that comes into existence that can create something out of nothing. As humans, we create things out of already existing raw materials. When you see glass, there is sand. When you see brick, there is soil. And when you see whatever you see, there is always uh, a raw material already pre-existent to that thing. So we are creative beings. God is creator. He creates out of absolute nothing everything. In this, he is mighty. That's why he said, I am Elohim. In the beginning, Elohim, the Trinitarian. Now, in the Arabic language, pluralism begins with the number three. One singular, two is dueto, three is plural. Now, plural begins with three and above. And we see in Genesis 1-1, Elohim is the pluralistic language of the one nature divine God. And we will see that there are three persons in the very same chapter when we go to verse 2 and 3. It says, God saw it was dark. God said, let there be light. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. They are three. Elohim, three in one, one in three. And the magnification of the singular unit is mightiness. God saw, God said, God hovered over the waters. God the Father saw, God the Son said. Since the Son is the Word, the Logos, then the Logos talks. God the Father saw, God the Son said, God the Holy Spirit hovered over the waters. He brought life because the Holy Spirit is the source of life. And that's why the fruits of the Holy Spirit are three. Love, joy, peace. Now, love relates to God the Father. Joy relates to God the Son. Peace relates to God the Holy Spirit. And we will come into that very shortly. Now, God the Father relates to that love, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Number one is love. So God the Father relates to that love. Why? Because... In John, in the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verse 16, what does it say? And so God loved the whole world that he gave his only begotten son, so that whoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, John 3, 16 does not mention the word God the Father. But how do we know that he is talking about God the Father? Because he says... And so God loved the whole world that he gave who? His only son. So since he gave his only son, so who gives the son? The father. There's no other one. So that's why God the father is talking. So God the father loves. So that's why the father relates to love. Now, love in its own, it's like magnets. It's gravity. Magnet draws every metal to it. Love draws everything to it. What holds the entire universe together is gravity. Until now, scientists, with all the scientific discoveries and advancement, they don't know where this gravity came from and how it functions. It's a mystery, just like energy. They know it exists, but we don't know what it is. And they still say, some of them, there is no God. Gravity holds everything together. 
brings everything together and keeps everything together. This is love. Love is the gravity that brings all into oneness and unity. Now, what is the opposite then to love? Since love brings everything together, then the opposite to bringing things together is disbursement. Now, what is disbursement? Is enmity. Enmity is opposite to love. Now, the nature of the Father is love. The nature of the Son is joy. Now, what is joy? We need to understand what joy is and why the Son relates to joy. God the Father, He is love. Out of His love, He came and created the whole world. Out of love, He created the whole world, and then He created man in His image and likeness. He created everything. What made Him create is love. Now, after He created everything, He came seeking joy in His creation. He searched in His entire creation for joy. He found not one spot that brought Him joy except one place called Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And he said it at the river Jordan in the gospel of Matthew chapter 4 and also Luke chapter 4. And he said it, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. I am well pleased, meaning I am joyous. This is my beloved son in whom I found my joy. To him you shall listen. So the son relates to joy. Why? Because God the Father out of love created everything and then he came back looking for the joy in his creation. He did not find it because everyone has fallen, has veered off the road and fallen short of the glory of God. There is no one good but God. Jesus came along and in John chapter 10 said, I am the good shepherd. There is no one good but God. And Jesus said, I am good, meaning I am the only son of God who is God in whom my father was well pleased, where he found his joy. Out of the entire creation of God the Father, Jesus of Nazareth is the only place where the father found his joy once and for all. For no one rejoiced the father except the son. Therefore, joy was found in the son and love was found in the father. And this love and this joy is, is being transferred into us by the Holy Spirit. God the Father is love, God the Son is joy, and the Holy Spirit brought that love and joy into our hearts, into our beings. In the first uh, epistle of St. John, chapter 1, verse 3, the first epistle of St. John, chapter 1, verse 3, he says the following, and our fellowship, <clears throat> excuse me, and our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son. St. John in this particular verse does not bring any mention of the Holy Spirit, yet the fellowship is supposed to be related to the Holy Spirit, as St. Paul mentions, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. But St. John, he says, and what? And our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son. No mention of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because our fellowship with the Father is through the Holy Spirit. And our fellowship with the Son is through the Holy Spirit. That's why he does not need to mention the Holy Spirit. Because it is the Holy Spirit that makes this fellowship possible. We have a fellowship with the Father. And we have a fellowship with the Son. Then the question that naturally arises, how do I come into this fellowship with the Father and the Son. How can I share the Father in His love? 
How can I share it? The day that comes that you rejoice in the Son, Jesus Christ, you are sharing the Father, His joy. The day that comes you rejoice in the Son of God, you are sharing the Father's joy. And how do I share or the, the Son's um, how can I be in unity with the Son the day that comes that I fulfill the commandments of the Father, I share the Son's um, love, joy, everything. So how can I be with the Father? When Jesus Christ is my joy, I am with the Father. How can I be with the Son when I fulfill the commandments of the Father? I am in unity with the Son. Why? Because the Father only rejoiced in the Son. The day you are rejoicing in the Son, you are one with the Father. And the Son came and said, It is not he who says to me, uh, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of God, but it is he who does the will of my Father will enter God's kingdom. So the day you fulfill God's will, God the Father's will, you are coming into unity with the Son. So when I rejoice in the Son, I am one with the Father. When I do the will of the Father, I am one with the Son.